There's no place I'd rather be There's no place I'd rather be No, no, no No place I'd rather be And here in your love Here in your love No place I'd rather be No place I'd rather be No place I'd rather be And here in your love Here in your love And I 
Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Bless you, Jesus. We want more of your presence, more of your glory, more of everything that is you. We want more of you. And Father, I know that it's not like you're up in heaven holding back until we're good enough because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's just a matter of us, Father, continuing to press in, and then we get that more. We get it. We get it. If it were impossible for us to conform to the fullness of the image of the glory of Christ, you would never have said that we could do it. And yet there's our potential right in front of us. Thank you so much. It's not a pipe dream, it's not an empty hope, it's not a wish, it's a reality. It's what we can do. I like that. Father, I pray that we would all, those here, those watching, that we would all be encouraged to not give up, to continue pressing into you 
because there's always more and more and more of everything you are. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Father, for your patience, your mercy, your grace, the way you put up with us. We don't want to put up with ourselves sometimes. But you are so wonderful. Thank you for that. Thank you. So, Father, tonight, this is another night of fellowship with you and with each other. May your presence and your glory be known here and wherever people are watching. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, you know what you got to do? You got to find somebody and, and just make them happy. Well, glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Uh, it's you. That's weird. This sounds terrible. I don't know if you can hear it or not. The buzzing. Hear it? <laughs> the speakers are buzzed, man. <laughs> We'll fix it. Oop. Ah, cable. You know, um, I ran soundboards for years. I'm not an expert, but I am good. And <laughs> well, no, what I'm getting at is this. Sound systems, there's no rhyme or reason. Things can happen, and you have no idea why. You can start a service and everything is perfect. Then all of a sudden you've got a noise coming through your system. You don't know where it's coming from. There is a... Um, I'm listening. There is a... Um, oh, there's a frequency. And I forget what the frequency is. Like 40 hertz or something like that. But anyway, there's a particular frequency that's... Uh, very difficult, and when it happens, even the best of the absolute best can sometimes not find out where it's coming from. It just happens. Uh, there's such a thing as dirty electricity. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but there's a thing called dirty electricity, and uh, we actually have a unit in here that the electricity plugs into it's kind of like a power strip, but it actually serves as to clean up the electricity. And then we plug the amplifiers and everything else into that unit so that they get clean electricity. If you look it up on the internet, it's kind of interesting how this happens. And it's a strange phenomenon. Uh, a building cannot be properly grounded, and so you end up with hums every now and then. Uh, so a lot of times things happen Anywhere, anywhere. It could be in the absolute best churches, best rock concerts, anywhere. Something can happen and you just don't know why. So, and me, um, you know, I'll just admit it. When it comes to sound system stuff, I am picky. Oh boy, I, I am picky to a fault. And I can be a real pain in, in uh, the neck. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and and uh, anyway, that's just me. Um, and in a way, I kind of like it that I'm that way because that means that we're going to strive to, to develop the best product that we can relative to everything that we do. So anyway, um, why did this happen? I don't know. It, it just it wasn't there before. Then all of a sudden, there it is. Go figure. Okay. Uh, again, I want to thank everybody for uh, last night, the Terry McAlman service. It was wonderful. He is at a church right now in Springfield, Ohio, ministering. Uh, and, you know, we'd like to think that what happened here was better. But, <coughs> you know, that's just the way it is. 
But anyway, I, I really hope and pray, you know, I prayed about it, that the service there tonight would be very powerful and would be uh, just that God's presence would be, would be very strong. Hallelujah. Okay, would you please turn to Luke chapter 19? Luke chapter 19. We're going to read a story very familiar, but this story, the Holy Spirit used it with me to illustrate a point. And this is a, uh, we'll just pick it up right here. We're not going to read the first part of chapter 19. We'll just get right into it in verse 12 where Jesus is talking and he says, A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him, to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have thou authority over ten cities. And a second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said likewise to him, Be thou also over five cities. And another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin. For I feared thee, because thou art an austere man. Thou takest up that thou laidst not down, and reapest that thou didst not sow. And he saith unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an austere man, taking up that I had not laid down, and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest not thou my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury? And he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. For I say unto you, that unto every one which hath shall be given, and from him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken away from him. I will stop right there. Now, I'm not going to go into trying to explain this parable tonight, but the Holy Spirit is using this to, uh, to exemplify a particular point. Here we have someone who had delegated responsibility to people. And we don't have a record of what happened with all of the servants. We just have a sampling of what took place. However, each one of them did something with what they were given. Every single one of them did something with it. Now, the one, he was able to take the pound and turn it into ten. The other, he took the pound turned it into five. But then we have this third one that's mentioned. He gave the pound back to his boss. And then he gave an explanation as to why, you know, well, I wrapped it up and saved it and blah, 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 and, and whatever. We could talk about his excuses, but that's not what this is about. The bottom line is nobody lost what they were given. They all maintained what they had been given. And each one did what they thought was the better thing with what they had been given. Now the one fellow, well, he presented the pound back. He didn't keep it for himself. If somebody had gone to him and said, well, who's, whose money is that? Whose pound is that? He would have said, well, now that's not mine. All right, that belongs to the boss. And when he gets back in town, I'm giving it back to him. He gave it to me. He entrusted me to its safety. Oh, okay, well, well you must be a, a, a pretty good employee. I mean, boy, I tell you what, I wish all my employees were like you, honest and full of integrity and all that. And so the boss shows up and he says, you know, here's your pound. And the boss says, well, wait a second. Um, I gave it to you and yeah, you did a good job by protecting it, by overseeing it, by making sure that it was safe. But you didn't do exactly what I said to do. Now, I appreciate the fact you didn't steal from me, that, that you kept it and you're giving it back to me. 
And I know that, you know, I, obviously I'm adding a lot of detail to this. But you didn't do what I told you to do with that I had given to you. Now, in that servant's mind, he didn't do anything bad. He just didn't do what he was supposed to. He didn't steal. He guarded and protected that which was given to him. And then when the boss shows up, he gave it back to him and says, there you go. And the boss says, okay, that's great. However, you had a responsibility to do more than just protect this. You were supposed to do something with it. And he said, you know, you could have at least put it in the bank and gained some interest. Okay, now, as I was reading through this, and really, I think the Holy Spirit was ministering to me, you know, about this message, and then reminded me of this passage, because it's been quite a while. But this is the way it happens within a lot of churches. In other words, people are given the talent of an assignment. What they do with it determines how they are used by God. Now, now I'm going to explain. Let's consider this example, our dear brother Guido. <laughs> yeah, you all know, you, you know Guido by now, right? <clears throat> okay, now, now Guido, he believes that God has called him to preach the word. And so he's looking forward to the day that he's going to stand, you know, behind the pulpit and deliver the word that God has given to him. Well, the pastor, he doesn't doubt that Guido has a call. And he and Guido are talking about this. And the pastor says, well, I'll tell you what, Guido, here's what we'll do. You know, I'm going to give you some things to do here in the church. You know, you believe that you're called to be a preacher and a teacher of the Word of God. So I'm going to give to you the young adult class, ages 19 through 25. Now, I want you to teach that Sunday school class every Sunday. Now, here's a list of the expectations that we give to every single teacher here in the church. And along with that, here is the lesson plan that we give to every single teacher here in the church. So you're going to be responsible for teaching that class. And so Guido, I mean, he's, he's kind of excited about this because it's an opportunity for him to, you know, begin operating in his calling. And the pastor says, you know, another thing, uh, Guido, I'll tell you what, we're going to make you in charge of the toilet paper in the church. Now, this means that you have to be sure there's toilet paper in every stall, in every restroom in the church, men and women. Just make sure there are no women in the restroom when you go in. <laughs> and uh, Guido, here is the name of the brand of toilet paper that we use here in the church. Now, when you put it on the rolls, make sure that it's going over the top it's <laughs> it's you know you guys haven't responded so positively to a sermon in years i should have preached about toilet paper a long time ago and so he says and the, now the toilet paper it has to go over the top not underneath and guido says well okay that's not, okay Pastor, no problem, man, I can do this. So, some time passes. And one day, the pastor walks into one of the restrooms. And, you know, he looks at a men's restroom. He walks into one of the... <laughs> and he looks in one of the stalls. And sure enough, there's toilet paper. But it's coming from underneath. And so he looks at another stall, okay, it's coming from over top, another stall coming from over top. In other words, in all the stalls, plenty of toilet paper, 
But in one of them, it's coming from underneath, not over top. So he checks the women's restroom, and he notices that in all of the stalls, it's coming over the top, except for one, coming underneath. And he wonders, well, maybe Guido didn't understand me. So he goes back to Guido, and he says, you know, Guido, here a while back, I asked you to be in charge of the toilet paper. And uh, re remember how I shared that the toilet paper is supposed to go over the top, not underneath? Well, I happen to notice in uh, one of the men's stalls and in one of the ladies, the toilet paper was going underneath, not over top. Um, I, you know, did somebody do this? I mean, did somebody come behind you? Oh, no, no, pastor. You know, nobody's messing with my toilet paper. He says, um, I, I remember you said that. Yeah, yeah, okay, all right. Um, and I'll fix it. I'll fix it. Everything will be okay. Pastor says, okay, well, you know, okay, good job. Thank you, Guido. Well, some time passes. Pastor goes back into the restroom, and uh, he looks in one of the stalls, and again, men's restroom, and he looks in one of the stalls, and he notices the paper is going underneath. And yet in the other stalls, you know, it's going over top. But he takes a closer look, and he realizes this is not the brand of toilet paper that we use here. You know, you can tell the brand of toilet paper by the imprint on the, okay. So, yes, I've studied my toilet paper. So, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, he starts wondering, well, what's the deal? So he goes to the supply closet and he opens the door and he looks. It's like, it's like a case of the wrong toilet paper. And he's mystified. So he goes to Guido. He says, Guido, um, got a question. You know, I was back in one of the restrooms and I noticed again that the toilet paper in one of the stalls was going underneath, not over top, but I also noticed uh, something else. The toilet paper in all the stalls is not the kind that we use here. Then I checked in the supply closet and I, I see we have a whole case of this other brand. Um, I mean, could you help me understand what's going on? And Guido says, oh, yeah, well, you see, the brand that the church has been using, it costs more than this other brand. Now, I know that you reimburse me when I go buy the toilet paper supply, but when I noticed that this other brand was far less expensive, I thought, you know what? I'm going to help the church. I'm going to help the church save money. I will be a good steward, and I'll buy this other toilet paper and, you know, that's what we'll use. Now, the pastor says, but Guido, you know, I, I shared with you that we use this other brand here and that the paper is supposed to go over the top. So, you know, please, you know, I, I gave you the, the note, tells you what kind. Um, please do this, okay? Guido says, oh, okay, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Time passes. Pastor goes back into the men's restroom, and he looks, and sure enough, it's that other brand of toilet paper, and some of the stalls it's going underneath, some it's going over top, and he realizes, we, we've got a problem here. Well, then, not only that, but he gets word that, like over the past year, Guido has been showing up late for the Sunday school class every now and then. In fact, over the past year, like seven or eight times, he just showed up 10, 15 minutes late. And yet that list that the pastor gave him clearly stated that all the teachers are supposed to be in a classroom 15 minutes minimum before class time. Then he also hears that Guido has been teaching things that are not on the lesson plan distributed to all the teachers. So, he goes to Guido, he says, Guido, um, I'm sorry, but you can't teach the class anymore. And you can't be over the toilet paper anymore. And Guido says, well, why not? Well, what's the problem? Well, Guido, you know, as far as teaching the class is concerned, we said you're supposed to be there 15 minutes before the class starts. And there have been times when you've shown up five, ten minutes late, you know, seven, eight times over the past year. Uh, you know, Guido, 
that's not what this is about. And then also I found that, that uh, you know, you've been teaching other things. You haven't followed this lesson plan. And Guido says, but, but I've been teaching this Sunday school class like you asked. And the pastor says, well, what about the toilet paper? And Guido says, but there's toilet paper in the stalls all the time. We've never had a stall without toilet paper. But Guido, that's not the way it's supposed to be done. Pastor, I don't get it. I'm, I'm saving the church money by buying this other brand. And, I mean, no disrespect, Pastor, but what difference does it make if it's over the top or underneath? I mean, if somebody sits in a stall one time and there's no toilet paper, they don't really care if it was going over top or underneath. They just want toilet paper. Guido, I understand what you're saying. However, you were told this is how it's to be done, and I, I put it in your hands. This is how it's to be done. Well, now see, we have two perspectives here. The pastor's perspective is, here's how it's supposed to be done. Guido's perspective is, I'm making sure there's toilet paper in the restrooms. And I am teaching the class every Sunday. So if somebody were to go to Guido and ask him, <clears throat> you know, I hear you're teaching the Sunday school class. And, you know, how's that going? Oh, I, it's going great. You know, doing fine. And, uh, you know, toilet paper. Yeah, that's going well, too. Everything's going fine. So in Guido's mind, he's doing what he was asked to do. In Guido's mind, he does not understand the problem. Because there's toilet paper in the restrooms. He is teaching the class. But from the pastor's perspective, Guido is not doing what he's supposed to do. Yes, there is toilet paper, but it's the wrong brand and it's going underneath, not over the top. Yes, he is teaching the class, but he's not doing it the way he was told to do it. In Guido's mind, there is no problem. But I ask you, is there a problem? Everybody in the church knows Guido, loves Guido. He's just the sweetest guy in the world. But is there a problem? Yes, there is. Is Guido ready to stand behind the pulpit? No, he's not. But he doesn't understand that. He thinks everything is okay. Everything is not okay. Guido has taken the pound of his responsibility and wrapped it in a napkin. You understand the symbolism? This is a major problem in churches all over. People are, are given instructions, here's how you do something, and they reinterpret what they see and they do something that to them gets the same results. But in reality, it is not what they were told to do. Then they don't understand why they're not being promoted or, or you know, whatever it would be. It's mystifying to them. And this is a setup for a major problem because if you try to bring correction, first off, they will agree. Remember Guido, he agreed. Yeah, pastor, that's right. You... But they will continue to do it incorrectly. Eventually, there may be some real conflict because that Guido mentality does not understand why there is a problem. But when instructions are given, just like this example here, here's what I want you to do. And those instructions are not followed. There is a problem. This goes on in churches all over the place. I mean, it's happened here over the years. People do things they think that, you know, are going to help or, you know, be a benefit. But it's not what is supposed to be done. Now, in some cases... Okay, again, the toilet paper example. I mean, really, as long as there's toilet paper in there, so what if it goes over top or underneath? But, yeah, if it goes underneath, I'm not using it, Brother Martin. That's just way. 
Well, you better use something, that's all. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> you know, but in the reality, I mean, what difference does it make? But it's the simplest of instructions that people tend to reinvent for themselves. Because in their mind, it doesn't matter. As long as we reach the finish line, what difference does it matter? Well, it matters. It matters. If you are told, here are steps 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and you do 1, 2, 6, 3, 7, 9, 5, 4, 10, okay, you still did all 10 steps, but you didn't do it the way you were told to do it. And when people have that kind of an approach, it is extremely difficult at times to bring correction because there's something going on in them they don't understand why they are being corrected. Now, I remember I had a job when I worked um, at a bank. And... To this day, I'm still not really clear what my job responsibility was. But I was supposed to do, at least this is what I thought I was supposed to do, proofreading of letters, just one-page letters, that were being sent to clients. So I said, okay. So I would look at the letter on the computer screen, and I would proofread, make whatever corrections were necessary, and that's it. There we go. Well, then one day, a supervisor calls me over. In fact, it was the supervisor that was writing the letters. It said, um, I noticed all these changes have been coming through on these letters. Um, have, have you been doing this? I said, uh, well, yeah, I thought that, you know, so and so on. Um, well, no, that, that's not really what you're supposed to be doing. I said, oh, I'm sorry. I, I really did misunderstand. Okay, from now on, you know, I won't do that. It's okay, really. I understand. It's not a problem. I won't do these changes anymore. And I can remember going back. It ended up, you know, fine. Everything. Everybody's happy. And I went back to my desk, and I'm thinking, okay, then what am I supposed to do if I'm supposed to review these letters before they go out, but I'm not supposed to make any changes? What do I do? What's my job here? So anyway, I just look at the letters and boom, send them on. <laughs> I didn't know what I was supposed to do. So obviously, there was miscommunication there. I thought I was supposed to do one thing, and I did it, but when I was told, no, that's not what you're supposed to do, I quit doing what I had been doing. Even though in my mind it still needed to be done, I let it go. It's like, no, this is not what they want. Fine, I'll just let it go. Now, in churches, people mean well. I think it's extremely rare that you have someone in a church who just wants to cause problems. Some people, they get a you know, burr under their saddle and get upset about things. And sometimes I think that out of their emotions, they do cause problems trying to get back at somebody in the church, but they really don't want to cause problems. You understand what I mean? They're not trying to split the church or anything like that. But nevertheless, these kind of things happen. I want to share a story with you that I heard Kenneth Copeland share. And, uh, you know, some people say, well, I don't like Copeland's doctrine. And other people say, well, I love Copeland's doctrine. You weren't here to talk about his doctrine, okay? So just listen. One thing I will tell you about that man, everything I've heard about him, even for people that know him, is that that ministry is a ministry of integrity. And, they, and how they handle the money and so forth. And uh, I have an incredible amount, immeasurable respect for Kenneth and Gloria Copeland and their ministry. Well, anyway, he was talking about how that, um, this goes back like to the, the 60s, when he first recognized God's call on his life for ministry. You know, he didn't, he didn't have anywhere to preach. I mean, there was nothing. But he knew he was called. So he began praying. And God spoke to him and, and told him, I've called you to a worldwide ministry. Well, you know, the way Kenneth Copeland explains it, he goes, that's pretty interesting when, you know, <laughs> you 
and nobody wants you to come and preach. I mean, there's nothing going on. So, after God told him that, um, the next day, he put on his suit and tie, and this is how he explains it. You know, the next day I got up, I put on my suit and tie, and I went on my first missions trip from the bedroom to the living room. <laughs> and he sat down with his Bible, pad of paper, and just studied all day long and prayed. Well, it was during that time of prayer that the Lord gave him three core instructions for his ministry. Number one, never ever ask someone for a place to preach, including passing out cards to influence an invitation. Boy, have I seen that done a lot. Number two, never ever preach someplace based on a financial arrangement. In fact, um, he even said if somebody calls him and says, now I know that you, know, you don't come from money and so on and so forth, but just want you to know ahead of time that we will be able to give you an honorarium of so much. He said, the moment they say something like that, I'm probably not going to go minister unless the Lord tells me to. Well, number three, never ask people to give money to meet personal needs. Now, he'll present ministry needs and so forth for offerings, but never ask money for personal needs. And so after the Lord told him that, he went to his wife, Gloria, and explained all this to her. And she was in agreement. And so um, they made a commitment right then and there. This is how this ministry is going to operate no matter what happens. This is the way it's going to be. Never going to ask for a place to preach. Never going to go somewhere and preach based on money. And uh, never going to ask for financial help or personal needs. And so they joined hands and they prayed. And... When they got done praying, in Jesus' name, amen, the phone rang. He went and he answered the phone, and it was a pastor wanting him to come and hold a meeting for him. Now, God was watching what they were doing. And he, Kenneth Copeland, in his heart, he and Gloria honored this mandate that God had given them. Well, Brother Copeland went and he ministered at that man's church. And as soon as that meeting was over, I don't know if it was a week or two weeks, but as soon as that meeting was over, I mean, like the day it was over, he was contacted by another pastor, would you please come and hold a meeting for us? And as soon as that one was over, he was contacted by somebody else, and it has just gone from there. And now, sure enough, here he has this worldwide ministry. What he did was take these instructions from God, apply them to his life and to his ministry, even though it didn't look like that was the better way to do it. Even though he had nowhere to preach, nobody was asking him to come and minister, nothing was going on other than he knew he had a call of God. And so, this is what, what we'll do. We'll see God honored that, and he began to move on Brother Copeland's behalf. And now here over 50 years later, we see the results. It is that kind of integrity which enables God to use people beyond where they presently are. It's that kind of integrity that sees to it the toilet paper goes over top instead of underneath. And what happens is... A lot of people, go ahead and turn over to Luke chapter 12. A lot of people measure tasks in a church according to their own scale of importance. And so, to Guido, the toilet paper going over the top, under the bottom, whatever, it really wasn't that important to him. But for whatever reason, it was that important to that church and that ministry. This is the brand of toilet paper we use. And it must go over the top. Well, again, that, that's a very simple illustration. But it's one that we can all kind of relate to because we all use toilet paper. So, <laughs> integrity, the kind of integrity that God looks for in someone, will be sure the toilet paper is going over the top. 
Well, be sure that even if it costs a little more money, brand number one is what will be purchased for the church. If there's a particular cleaning fluid that is used, you know, to clean the toilets or whatever the case would be, you don't go to the cheapo store and buy the cheapo stuff. You buy what is being used in the church. Yeah, but Brother Martin, you know, I've got this responsibility to, to clean the restrooms and, and this over here is going to be a whole lot cheaper. Well, you know what? Maybe that's what's used in other places. But in this church over here or that church, whatever the case would be, no, we use this kind of cleaner. Now see, to some folks, that can be a little monkish. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about when I say, you don't have no idea what I'm talking about. You ever seen that TV show, Monk? Okay, if you've never seen it, it's one of the best shows that's ever been out on TV. This guy was like, what is it, OCD? Yeah, and everything had to be just perfect. You know, you got to cut the crusts off the bread before you can make a sandwich and all that. It's hilarious, absolutely hilarious. If he were in here and walking up and down the aisles, he would have to touch every pew as he walks by. <laughs> well, anyway, some people would think, you know, that's a little OCD, that you have to have that kind of toilet paper. It has to go over the, over the top, and blah, blah. You know what? That's not your call. That is not your call. If that is your responsibility, you do it the way that you're told to do. And here's what's interesting. You can have a, like a, a 200, 300 people in a church. Everybody's going to say, yes, that's right. Amen, amen. 50 of those people, they are doing something they shouldn't be doing, but in their minds, everything's being done correctly. You got a problem, a real problem. And these are the kind of people that can cause issues in a church and not even realize they're causing issues. Because in their mind, they are achieving the same results by doing it a different way so they don't see there is a problem. But there is a problem. There is a problem. Um, in Luke chapter 12, Verse 22, Jesus says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life of what you shall eat, neither for the body what you shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? And which of you, with taking thought or worrying, can add to his statue, stature one cubit? If ye then be not able to do that which thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But rather... Seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that ye have, and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. Now look at this 34th verse. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be. If your treasure is not... The goals of the church you attend. Your heart will not follow the instructions you are given. I don't care who you are. I don't care how nice you are. You will not do what you're told to do. You will pay half attention to what you're supposed to do. You'll do what you think ought to be done. You'll do, and you're not being mean about it. That's the thing. You're not being cruel. You're not being harsh. You're not being gossipy. You're being nice. You really think that you're doing okay. But if you're not doing it the way you're told, you're failing. And you are falling short in your service unto God. The problem is too many Christians don't see it that way. It is a lack of integrity in the body of Christ. You know, before the service last night, Terry McCallman and I were talking about that, how that in, in uh, Christians nowadays, it's harder and harder to find people well, in the world as well, but it's harder to find Christians who are of that kind of character and integrity. And see, you can be, you can be living a, quote, sinless life. 
There's, there's nothing going on. There is no reproach. But when it comes to your responsibilities, when you begin to measure them according to your scale of importance, then those things which don't seem to be as important to you, well, you don't put forth as much effort to get them done. Here's what you don't understand. Think of it this way. In Luke, no, not Luke, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you see Paul begin giving this illustration of the human body. You know, how can the ear say it doesn't need the eye? And how can the nose say it doesn't need, you know, the elbow? Or, you know, all these different things that he says as he goes through there. If you have a little toe that is hurting, does that not impact your entire body? You say, well, I don't know, Brother Martin. All right, well, go home, take a hammer. <laughs> Give your little toe, just one of them. Give it a good hard whack. And, and just say, you're, you will compensate the way that you walk. And that's going to impact your legs. It will impact your back. You could throw your back out. You could have all kinds of It's going to impact your breathing. It's going to impact, literally, it will impact the way that you eat and digest your food because you're altering what you do physically, and it's just your little toe. In fact, did you know that if your little toe were amputated, you would have to relearn how to properly balance yourself when you walk? And it's just your little toe. Too many people, they see responsibilities as little toes. Not really that important. I mean, you can't even see it unless you take your shoes and socks off. But if the little toe is not functioning properly, the entire body can be thrown off. Now, some people might say, this sounds a little melodramatic, but it's not. It's not at all melodramatic. Uh, you know, somebody might say, well, you know what? I know you said to do it like this, but see... In the other church I attended, we did it this way. Well, okay, I'm guessing it worked in that church. But that was that church. It's different here. It's different in, in this church now where you're attending. Now, maybe the way you did it in the other church really is a better idea. Go to whoever is your you know, supervisor or whatever and just say, hey, I, I just want to share something with you. Um, not trying to force anything, but you know, in our other church, here's how we did such and such. Now, uh, I'm not saying that we have to change here. I'm just letting you know what we did. And if it can be of any benefit, well, praise God. And if not, that's okay. Just, you know, toss it out the window. I just wanted to let you know. Well, for all you know, that suggestion, that idea may be exactly what that church needs to start doing. But for you to do it without first acknowledging, talking about, discussing, and so forth. Okay, you're out of order. And you're not doing what you're supposed to do. Look in Proverbs chapter 10. See, there are things out there other churches are doing that maybe we could do here, and it would be a better thing. You know, the Bible talks about you know, wisdom and a multitude of counselors and so forth. And, and it is good for ideas to be shared. And even though it may sound like a good idea, if it's not what God wants, if it's not going to be the appropriate thing to do at this time, well, then it won't be done. However, it's not wrong to share. Not at all wrong to share. Just don't get offended. And, and that's, boy, is that a problem. Don't get offended if what you think of isn't implemented. And that's where the Guidos get highly offended. Well, Guido, why are you leaving the church? The pastor, he didn't want me here no more. What do you mean? Well, I've been doing my, I've been teaching a Sunday school class. I've been there every Sunday. Every bathroom stall has got toilet paper. And yet he says, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to. You know, I'm out of here. It's like, wait a second. There's more to the story. And Guido's not telling it. But Guido's offended. Instead of saying, I'm leaving the church because I messed up and the pastor called me on it. And I don't like it because like Frank Sinatra, I want to do it my way. So I'm out of here. <laughs> There's more to the story. Well, here in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 9, he that walketh uprightly, that word uprightly, part of its definition is with integrity. He that walketh with integrity 
walketh surely, or is stable in his life. But he that perverteth his ways shall be known. Well, what does that mean, perverteth his ways? Simple, simple illustration. He that maketh the toilet paper roll from underneath instead of over top. He was told what way to do it, but he perverted that way to do it differently. Now, obviously, we're talking here more than just toilet paper. We're talking about the sum total of everything that's done. Look in Proverbs 11, verse 3. The integrity of the upright shall guide them, but the perverseness of transgressors shall destroy them. See, here's what you don't understand. When you start doing it your way, when you start going outside the boundaries of what is expected, you're interfering with your walk with God. Because, see, God honors authority. Even if the authority is messed up, God honors authority. In fact, in Scripture, it talks about, you know, there wouldn't even be leaders if God didn't put them in place. That doesn't mean that God puts evil people to rule over everybody. What it means is God has established the concept of authority. And so, therefore, when you begin doing things your own way and you leave steps three, six, and nine out of the ten steps, okay, you're interfering with your own walk with God. Because, well, look over in um, Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. In verse 22. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive a reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what people miss. When they're in a church doing things, they're not serving the pastor or the Sunday school director, whatever it would be. They're serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And when they start doing things their own way, they're missing what God wants them to do. You don't have to turn to this, but in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, Jesus says, why call me Lord, Lord, and and you don't do what I tell you to do? Well, when you're in a church, I mean, this is any church anywhere. It's not just here. And you have responsibilities. The expectation is you're going to do what you're asked to do the way you're asked to do it. Now, obviously, there's always going to be a little bit of flexibility. We understand that. You know, Guido, I don't care which stall you start with. Just make sure that, you know, the paper's in there, it goes over the top, and it's brand number one. Look in 1 Samuel chapter 16. See, this may sound like a, a real simple matter to a lot of people. But the moment that you think it's a real simple matter, I'm going to find a church for you to pastor so that you can experience firsthand what I'm talking about. Because... It's one of the hardest things that a pastor faces. People who are nice, people are not trying to cause problems. People who want to help, they want to be involved. And yet when they're given assignments and tasks, they don't do what they're supposed to do. They do not follow through the way they've been asked to do whatever it is that they're supposed to do. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, Saul has messed up too many times. God says, I'm replacing him, and I'm going to put somebody else in as king over Israel. It'll be somebody after my own heart. He says, Samuel, I want you to go to the household of Jesse, and I'll show you who to anoint as king. So Samuel goes to uh, Jesse's household, and uh, Jesse has all of his sons there, except for one, David. We know the story. But in verse 6, it says, And it came to pass, when they were come, all of Jesse's sons, except for David, that he, Samuel, looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. See, we look at people, their personality their um, natural talents and abilities, we have a, a tendency to want to esteem them, to promote them in our own minds. And yet God is looking beyond that. He's looking at the heart. 
And he knows, remember the story uh, where Jesus was talking to the, uh, about the, the servants? Faithful in the little, then you'll be faithful in the much. A lot of people don't understand why they aren't given more responsibilities within churches, but they haven't been faithful with the little. And see, one of the responsibilities for a pastor is to seek God and to find out, okay, God, what am I supposed to do? I mean, as far as the people in the church, you know, who do I use? Who do I not use? You know, who do you want for whatever? I mean, help me see this. I want your eyes on this one. And a lot of people in the church may think, well, I don't know why in the world the pastor's not using Guido. I mean, that guy, he's, why, why it's obvious there's a call of God on his life. Well, yeah, it, that may be obvious, but what's not obvious, the Guido's challenged. And Guido is not being faithful in the little. Why in the world would, would the pastor want to start promoting Guido into greater levels of responsibility because if he's going to mess up with the toilet paper, you know sooner or later he's going to mess up with something else. If we looked as Christians, if we looked at everything that we do within a church as having the same kind of importance as preaching the gospel to the lost, our approach would be very different. Because you see, God looks at the sum total of what a church does as a, quote, body. In that, you know, the, the, the camera operator, the soundboard operator, the singer, the musician, the Sunday school teacher, the usher, the deacon, the whatever, I mean, everything, it's supposed to work together in harmony to accomplish God's goal for that particular church. And when that doesn't happen, things get off track, if you will. You know, over the years, I've had people come to me, I'll do this, I'll do that. They don't do it. Well, guess who ends up doing it? Me. Now, I'm not standing here complaining because I know that's the way it is when you pastor. People don't do what they're supposed to do the way they're supposed to. Well, somebody's got to step in and get it done. So usually that's the pastor. So no complaint. Man, I, hey, listen, let me tell you something. Ever since March 1st, 1997, I have never worked a day in my life because that's the day I went full-time in ministry. This is not a job for me. I wouldn't trade this for anything. Absolutely nothing. Now, I, you know, sometimes people would say, well, you know, you're working pretty hard, all the stuff you do, but I don't see it as work. You know, that, that just, this is life. So I'm not complaining. But what I am saying is this. For those of you here, for those of you watching, whatever church that you might attend, those of you listening, give heed to what you do in your church. Are you doing it the way you've been instructed to do? If not, there's a problem. And the problem is not with God or the instructions. The problem is with you. And you're holding yourself back in being more usable by God in what he wants to do. Now, I'm hoping that this is encouraging to every one of you here and those of you listening. Because this is one of those kind of things a lot of people just don't think about. Because sometimes they just don't think it's all that important. Well, you know what? The little things are extremely important to God. So guys, take this to heart. Those of you here, those watching, take this to heart. And uh, if the Lord reveals to you that there needs to be improvement in some areas, you know what? Just make the improvements. It's okay. He'll help you. And you'll be back on track. Hallelujah. Well, go ahead and stand. A bunch of people stand. Oh, he's preaching at me tonight. He's preaching. <laughs> well, if the shoe fits, lace it up. Hallelujah. <laughs> that's my version okay um, <clears throat> part two of this, this service tonight one of the things that I have observed over the years and I really don't have hard scripture yet to confirm this but it's what I've seen happen in the body of Christ it's an, it's an odd phenomenon, and it's directly related to faith. It seems like when 
somebody is healed of a of a sickness of a disease like something major it seems like that there is an anointing on them to minister healing to other people i've seen this i've seen it many times now we have somebody with us tonight brother mike o'brien this man's been healed twice of cancer and we won't get into all of the testimony but he has prayed for people Healings have manifested. Miracles have taken place. And uh, he didn't know I was going to do this, but he probably has an idea where I'm headed real quickly here. If you're here tonight and you're believing for God, for a, a manifestation of healing in your body, I don't care what it is. I'd like you to come up here and just put your toes on this blue line. And Brother Mike, I'm going to ask you to pray for these folks. Now, you don't have to go into a litany of well, here's the problem, and, you know, I think I got it from Grandma, and all, no, no, you don't have to go into all of that, but he's just going to pray for you as the Lord leads. Now, see, the reason I know I can pop this on him is because, number one, we're friends, and number two, I know he likes to pray for people. <laughs> so, Brother Mike, you just go ahead and pray for these folks, and uh, however the Lord leads, and Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you for what the Lord Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen.
Mike, if you would just come right over here in front of the camera. Those of you who are at home watching this, he's going to pray for you right now. So whatever it is, just right there, you receive from the Lord this healing. Brother Mike. Amen. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I speak to anything and everything that's not of you, Lord. Amen. On the people here that's watching. In Jesus' name, we know that that name 
Yes, every knee has to bow. Doesn't matter what sickness it is or what disease. Every tongue has to confess. Yes. That Jesus Christ is Lord. Thank you, Father. So I speak healing now in Jesus' name. I also so speak as well the fact that it's very important that you confess the word over yourself. Yes. Now you can appropriate who you are in Christ yes. and draw the line and say, no, no, he can never pass that. And know that you're healed no matter what may try to hit you. But if you're not that comfortable with that, then you need to take the word and confess it. Amen. And know this, and I speak to somebody here, that you have three score and ten. Don't let the enemy lie to you. You have at least ten. Amen. Psalm chapter 90, verse 10. You have at least ten. He will never break his oh, covenant. Yeah. Never. Amen. Never. He'll never alter it. The doctor might say to you, you have this and that. He has the facts. But God is the truth. Amen. Yes. Praise God. Receive that. And if you need to confess the word, I'm telling you, take the word. God will show you which one to confess, yep. which will be pertinent to you. And if you do not, then receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because when you speak in that other language, you speak the mysteries. Yep. And in that mystery is your healing specific. Yep. And he'll show you that. Yes. By his stripes you were healed. Amen. Receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Everybody stand. Hallelujah. I don't have a problem letting other people do some praying. Especially when I know that other people seem to carry a greater anointing in a particular area than what has yet manifested in my own life. Hey, we want the results. Praise God. We want the results. So Father, I thank you for all the healings that have taken place here tonight. We thank you for your word. It has gone forth. And we say it's going to produce fruit and your will in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, thank you guys uh, for being here tonight. Uh, if you have an offering before you leave, just go ahead and uh, bring it up to the offering plate. And uh, those of you watching, thanks for being with us. Thanks for joining us for this wonderful evening. All right, you guys have a blessed remainder of this evening, and we'll see you next time.